There is no safe level of alcohol in pregnancy that is evidence-based. Yeah. That's really what we're saying. The safest thing you can do for your pregnancy is to have an alcohol-free pregnancy. Hello, my name is Noreen Turley and you are welcome back to our HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. Today we are going to discuss alcohol and pregnancy and to discuss this very tricky subject we are delighted to be joined by two experts with many years of experience between them. We have Dr. Mary O'Mahony who's consultant in public health medicine and the HSE's clinical lead for FASD prevention. We are also joined by Professor Maeve Ogan consultant, obstetrician and gynaecologist for the HSE. Thank you both very much for joining us today. Alcohol and pregnancy, when I was preparing for this podcast, I thought it was a very tricky subject because over the years we've had very mixed messages about it. There was a time where doctors in Ireland used to recommend a can of Guinness for women for the iron when they were pregnant. And then in more recent times, there was a perception that the real risk from alcohol was confined to the first trimester when the structure of the brain is developing We now know that that is actually wrong and that at all stages, alcohol can affect the brain of the developing fetus. I suppose we want to talk about, I mentioned FASD at the beginning, Mary. So what is FASD and FAS? Well, FASD stands for Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders. And it's a range of disorders that are caused by the developing baby being exposed to alcohol while it's developing within the womb. And then in a small percentage of those cases, in 10 percent, the baby will be born with maybe characteristic facial features or might be noticeably kind of smaller than expected or have a small head. And that small subgroup, which is only about 10 percent of the total, is called fetal alcohol syndrome. But most children who are born with a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, it's not recognisable at birth. Okay. They will look perfectly normal. They'll be of kind of expected weight and um, it's only really... Some of them will even screen normal in preschool years. Yeah. And it's only when they get into kind of problem solving, when they start doing maths and languages in about third or fourth class of national school, that they're the full extent of their difficulties will manifest. So it's a lifelong disorder. And these children would have difficulties, kind of both physical, mental, behavioral, social and educational. And they'll need support throughout their life. So it's nearly like a hidden syndrome then, is it, or a hidden... For a lot of them to be a hidden disability, because there's a full range. It is a spectrum, there's a full range. Some will have more difficulties than others. What are the figures in Ireland, or do we have figures on, like, how many children a year do we think are born with this? Well, the best evidence that is available came from a study that was published back in 2017. And that was a Canadian group who had looked at the evidence, we'll say, internationally, on drinking during pregnancy and on the prevalence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And they were keen to arrive at an actual risk. You know, we'll say if you drink during pregnancy, what's your risk of having a child with fetal alcohol syndrome or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? And they used in some countries there had been active case ascertainment. So they had very good data on the prevalence of FASD. And in other countries, I suppose they had good information maybe on drinking during pregnancy. For Ireland, they would have used what the World Health Organization uses, which was based on a 20 year study that was done in the Coombe some years back, which kind of found that maybe up to 60 percent of women were drinking during pregnancy. And so for Ireland, it was an estimate. But what they found is that they found that in Ireland, they thought had the third highest rate of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder of the 187 countries that they had studied. The third highest. The third highest. So it's estimated that about 600 babies would be born with fetal alcohol syndrome, which is kind of just that small subgroup yeah. that would have the facial features or other other visible characteristics. And that, you know, nine to ten times more children would be born each year with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. OK, so we could have based on what we had know, it's estimated we say about 600 babies per year and mm. that there'd be maybe up to 40,000 living with the condition of fetal alcohol syndrome in Ireland. Other countries, when they've looked at it in New Zealand, they have estimated that 45% of their children in state care would have a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And that and these people often struggle to be kind of recognised really and to get yeah. the help and support that yeah. they need. So what happens if somebody does drink during pregnancy? What actually happens and how does that affect the baby or the fetus? Well, when somebody drinks during pregnancy, the alcohol, which is both it's fat and water soluble. It can pass through all kind of biological 
membranes really, it passes straight from the mother's blood through the placenta into the baby. So the baby can metabolize it themselves. Yeah. They're only developing. So they're relying, we say, really on the mother's metabolism. From about 14 weeks within the womb, the baby will actually swallow and excrete amniotic fluid. So that actually kind of can give a recycle of, oh, yeah. of alcohol yeah. within the womb for the baby. So there's no evidence-based safe level of alcohol during pregnancy. Yes. Do you know? But the risk is actually quite high. What they found is that it only takes 67 women to drink during pregnancy for a child to be born with fetal alcohol syndrome, and that it only takes 13 women to drink during pregnancy for a child to be born with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Now, that's an, an average risk, and it is a dose-related risk. Okay. So, you know, the more you drink, and if you drink very heavily, you know, yeah. you'll have a rate greater than 1 in 67. Do you know, and if you drink less, you'll have a much lesser, you know, chance of having a baby that's affected. And do you find that it's very difficult for women not to drink during pregnancy? Well, you know, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is a toll of our drinking culture in yes. Ireland. You know, that's why we have the third highest rate internationally. The best way of preventing fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is if the population's consumption of alcohol can go down. Because, you know, it's a social norm in Ireland to drink. And we know that two in five pregnancies are unplanned. Mm -hmm. So a woman can be pregnant before they realise and yeah. will be, might be drinking before they realise that they are pregnant. There's the Public oh, Health yeah. Alcohol Act. Just very recently, the minister signed into law the labelling regulations. Yes. And there's going to be information for pregnancy and not to drink during pregnancy on those, isn't there? Yes. So they'll be labelling on every bottle of alcohol, which is to yeah. give the woman information, really, you not know, to make their decision. That would be identified there. And then minimum unit pricing, I suppose, is yeah. another very important measure. I mean, we haven't changed the excise duty on alcohol since 2014, whereas we have been increasing it on smoking kind of year on year because we're very keen to cut down on smoking. But, you know, we could be using excise duty as yeah. well as something to try to modify the price of alcohol to kind of decrease its consumption. The World Health Organization recommends that, you know, we need to increase price, we need to reduce the availability and we need to curb advertising if we mm. want to reduce alcohol consumption in the population. And that would be the most effective way that yeah. we could actually reduce the toll of fetal yeah. alcohol spectrum disorder, which is increasing day on day. Yeah. If we have 600 being born each year in Ireland. Yeah. And Maeve, in your job, obviously you're the lady who sees all the pregnant ladies coming in. What type of advice do you maybe give if they have it in an occasion that they've had a few drinks before they come into you and there's a lot of guilt around that for them. How do you deal with that kind of situation and the reality of it on a daily basis? So often, as we all know from pregnancy, one of the hardest bits can be conflicting advice or confusion. You should have an epidural, you shouldn't have an epidural. Those type of things can make a pregnancy very complex yeah. for somebody. Similarly with alcohol, you know, if somebody goes to their GP to confirm their pregnancy and their GP says, oh, a drink or two is probably fine. And then they see a midwife who says, no, you really should avoid alcohol in pregnancy. Yes. And then they see an obstetrician who says, ah, the occasional drink will be fine. Again, that's very confusing and can be stressful yeah. and can create a sense of anxiety. I and mean, I suppose, as Mary says, and has been mentioned on, on previous podcasts in this series, the important thing is to get consistent messaging out there that there is no safe level of alcohol in pregnancy that is evidence based. That's really what we're saying. The safest thing you can do for your pregnancy is to have an alcohol free pregnancy. That being said, and we see this very frequently, people come in an early pregnancy, they hadn't known they were pregnant or just the day before they did their pregnancy test, they were at a wedding, they had a night out, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, they're very concerned about the potential adverse impact. Yeah. And generally, for most people, the impact of, you know, one or two drinks prior to knowing their pregnancy is null. But the important thing is that we support them to have the remainder of their pregnancy as an alcohol free pregnancy. And it's important that we use the right language. You know, when somebody comes in for their first visit where they're meeting a midwife or meeting a doctor and if we say to them, you haven't had any alcohol, have you? That's very judgmental comment. Yeah, it's a loaded comment, yeah, a loaded question. Yeah. And you can imagine in that context, 
if you either have had some alcohol and you're worried about it, or indeed if you have an issue with alcohol addiction, Mm -hmm. it's going to be very hard to put your hand up and say, well, actually I have, and I'm worried about problematic or challenging alcohol intake. I need support. It's very hard to ask that. And that's why it's important that we ask it in a supportive way and that we give consistent information. And, you know, that includes reassuring people who've had the, you know, occasional drink prior to knowing they were pregnant or while they were trying to conceive, you know, in the main, not an issue at all. Reassuring people, for example, if they have a bad outcome, you know, not infrequently we see people say who've come with an early pregnancy miscarriage. And of course, any of us who've been on that journey knows you interrogate everything that you did prior to the miscarriage. Could this have caused it? Could that have yeah, caused it? Absolutely. Equally, people say, you know, I was at a night out, I was at a wedding, you know, I, I had some alcohol before I knew I was pregnant. Could that have caused it? In the main, absolutely not. The important thing going forward is that we give people consistent messaging. Yes. So whether you're with your GP practice nurse, your GP, your midwife, your doctor or in antenatal education classes, that consistently we say to people, the safest thing as regards alcohol in pregnancy is to avoid it entirely. And Maeve, why do you think there is such confusion or such different opinions about that and that women are getting inconsistent messages? Now, I know and we'll talk about it later, we have done some videos for healthcare staff who may be dealing with difficult situations, how to talk to women about alcohol and pregnancy. But what do you think it is? Is it our culture? Is it because people's personal opinion, they feel guilty themselves? Or what is it that we are I mean, so... I think it's, it's exactly what Mary said. Yeah. We have a culture in this country and in other countries where alcohol is a part of daily life. And, you know, the idea of a society kind of leaving an entire time in someone's life where they should avoid alcohol entirely is a sort of a new concept. And fine, all throughout pregnancy, as you say, even back in the 70s, when people were encouraged to have Guinness is good for you and all of that, they weren't being told to have 10 cans of Guinness a day or 10 pints of Guinness a day. But nevertheless, I think it comes from that place. And I would absolutely agree with you. I think things have improved a lot in terms of the consistency of messaging. You know, if you look at any of the the public health HSE websites, the messaging is very consistent. I think to be fair, most GPs, practice nurses, midwives and doctors would be giving the same message now. Yeah. But perhaps it hasn't percolated entirely down into into society. Yeah. And I know so I was, we need to do more yeah. work on that, really. Yeah. And I was, I was talking to a patient about this yesterday and she was sort of saying to me, you know, and she's a very sensible person who doesn't take excessive amounts of alcohol at any stage. But she said her mother's constantly trying to, you know, give her a glass of rosé at the yeah. weekends. I did it in my pregnancy. It's yeah, fine. You sure know, it'll do help you, you no relax. harm. You might sleep a bit better, yeah. you know, and it's coming just from a place of, you know, a different culture, a different time, yeah. different education, different evidence. We, Absolutely. we have the evidence. And we now. also have situations where people don't want to tell people that they're pregnant just because they're in the very early stages and they don't want and they're going around with a glass of wine in their hand just to pretend because the minute you're not drinking, somebody says, oh. Huh, What's wrong with you? Are you pregnant? Yes. So it's just an automatic thing. Yeah. And that's part of the culture that actually, you know, it it should be entirely appropriate for somebody to socialise without alcohol and not be interrogated as to why they're not drinking. But you're absolutely right. And in fact, this same person that I was talking to yesterday was saying, oh, it's much easier in this pregnancy. She's on her third pregnancy compared with her first because she said there's so many non-alcoholic alternatives. You know, but again, what is that about our society that we have to be walking around with a glass of wine for people to think you're having a good time? I know, pretending that it's, yeah, it is. And we have had a conversation already with Sheila Galhini from Alcohol Action Ireland. And it's just consistent messaging like you say that we need to give to people that it is okay Mm -hmm. not to drink and I suppose we'd hope that over over time just like we've done with smoking and the risks involved in smoking that people will become more clear about alcohol and the risks involved with alcohol and equally we have to have the supports then for people who do have a problem with alcohol exactly I mean as was mentioned in in that that excellent podcast with with Dr Sheila Ganahini you know Alcohol is a drug and addiction is an illness. Yes. And pregnancy is a time when people may feel supported to disclose that. And it's really important that we don't respond to that disclosure with fear or blame or shame. 
but we respond with solutions. Yeah. And Maeve, in the Rotunda, you have a midwife that you can refer people on to if they're finding that they have a problem. For sure. I mean, yeah. we have the HSE National Maternity Strategy and the Drug Strategy supports the role of the Drug and Alcohol Liaison Midwife. And that's a specialist midwife between the addiction services and the maternity services to support women who have either current or previous problems with alcohol use yeah. and to give them the supports they require to navigate a pregnancy without alcohol. And, you know, there may be people who have very significant issues with alcohol, who have had significant binge drinking in the early part of pregnancy. Yeah. And, you know, if you just respond to a disclosure like that to say, oh, well, you know, your baby has a high risk of fetal alcohol syndrome or a high risk of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, you're really not going to support that woman for the remainder of her pregnancy. She's going to be terribly anxious about the already impact that yeah. may have happened for her pregnancy. And she's maybe going to feel, you know, the horse is bolted. What's the point in closing yeah, the stable absolutely. door now? Whereas if you can actually support people and say, you know, as Mary describes a dose response curve. So, you know, if somebody can draw a line under their alcohol intake at 12, 13, 14 weeks, that's surely better than continuing to drink till 38, 39 yeah, weeks. Absolutely. Um, and Maeve, do you find then that in the strategy, it is hoped that there will be a midwife liaison in all of the maternity mm -hmm. hospitals. And I think mm -hmm. there's 19 maternity hospitals. Yeah, there's 19 there? maternity hospitals. At the moment, the three Dublin hospitals have a drug and alcohol liaison midwife. And there is one in the southeast. So okay. covering Wexford, Waterford, Clonmel, Kilkenny, I believe. There are recruitment campaigns currently, I believe, for both Galway and Limerick. But there's large parts of the country that don't, don't have, have access. It. And you mm. can imagine if you're a midwife or a doctor in that yeah. unit and somebody discloses to you, you know, well, can you direct them towards yeah. the appropriate supports? Yeah. And therefore, might you instinctively kind of say, well, I'm not sure if I really want to ask this question or because yeah. I don't know what to do with the, the answer that I yes. get. And equally, you know, we want people to ask, not just once, not just at mm. the booking visit, but mm. ask in a supported way throughout the pregnancy. You know, you've had a podcast previously on making every contact mm. count, and that's mm. so important. And if we have all the wraparound supports for somebody who does disclose problematic alcohol intake, we are going to be in a better place for their health and their baby's health yeah, going forward. Absolutely. Well, it's fantastic to know that it's part of the strategy and that they are working on it. There is recruitment campaigns underway. And Mary, last year you did some research. We did a survey of staff in Ireland as to their knowledge and attitudes towards alcohol and pregnancy and uh, what they knew about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So we actually had a reply from 760 staff. Now it was both healthcare, social care, education staff we, we had uh, surveyed. I suppose basically they felt they had good knowledge of FASD, but very few of them would have felt confident in diagnosing it. And less than 40 percent of them felt that they had, had had actually diagnosed a case of FASD, whereas these children are probably very common in Ireland. Yes. Now, they were good, generally about 70 percent of them of GPs and of obstetricians and midwives that they they said that they did approach the whole issue of alcohol during pregnancy. OK, you know, with so women. going back to what Maeve was saying, so it, that's good to know that that's 70 percent, but I mean, we want 100 percent. We want 100 percent. But I'm not sure how they were asking about it then, because only very few of them really overall used any kind of validated tool okay. for kind of asking about alcohol. Yeah. If we're making progress, but we'd probably have more progress. More progress, yeah. To me. What was the other findings then in the in the research, Mary, that might be interesting for people? Only about 50 percent of staff at the same time of healthcare staff felt comfortable about raising the issue okay. with uh, with women. So like last year, we have done videos, you know, for the different groupings kind of, well, when, you know, mm. for the obstetrician from the GP or from the midwife, just as to how they might broach the topic yeah. with women. So that's that's available for yeah. those who might want to so explore only that further 50 themselves. So percent felt comfortable asking. Yes. Isn't that interesting when you think about the whole smoking thing and people have no problem asking no about problem smoking. Asking smoking? And is that because of their own behaviour? Do you think that they feel like they're preaching to the woman then if they're asking them for about some it? For some reason, broaching the issue of alcohol is just seems to be a problem, yeah. And like when you look at alcohol, like... You know, we're more aware of it now, but we're drinking more now. You know, back yeah. in the 60s, our alcohol per capita was about six litres. Yes. Whereas we're up at about 10 now. You know, we've been greater than 10 at times in the past. And 
if the average person was drinking at low risk guidance, which means that 50% would be taking less and 50% would be taking more than that. In Ireland, we'd have an alcohol per capita of about 5.8. At the moment, we have a national target to get it down to something like 9.1. That's still saying that the average person is drinking over, you know, low risk, low risk guidance. And even low risk guidance, I suppose, is for the adult who isn't pregnant. Yes. You know, it's not because we don't, we're not aware of low risk alcohol during pregnancy or for the health of the mother herself and for the health of the developing baby. And baby is this it. message, no amount of alcohol is safe during pregnancy. Is this part of the education for all of the healthcare professionals? Is it in their curriculum, I wonder? Well, I think we need to look at that because very few would have received any yeah. information on FASD. We know that from the survey as well during their undergraduate okay. career. Yeah. So that would be an important, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, doctors, nurses, OTs, physio, any healthcare staff that people come in touch with when they are pregnant, that they are aware of the dangers and that they can in some way maybe assist the woman or advise them or support them in the right way. So that would be an interesting one to look at and see how much they do know about it. But obviously your research then, you're writing it up at the moment, Mary. So writing I it up at the moment. It's not out there just yet, but not I think yet. there's going to be some interesting findings yeah. that we can work on with that. And as Maeve has said, the importance of the consistent message yes. you know, is really key because a woman meets a lot of caregivers during yes. her pregnancy and she needs to be getting the same message from each woman. And we all know that women, when they are pregnant, they go to great ends really to try yeah. to ensure that they're doing the best possible thing yes. for the baby yeah. that's developing in their yeah. home. They kind of give up all sorts of food and drink that they've heard wouldn't be good for the baby. So they need to have very clear advice yeah. that it's best to avoid alcohol because they would give up, they would change their behaviour and they would give up yeah. alcohol for pregnancy if they knew that they that they were to do it. Most of them would be able to, I mean, as Maeve has said, there'll be some women you know, who have an addiction to alcohol and their patients themselves yeah. and they need additional help and support and they would have difficulty, you know, complying with mm. that. But they can be helped if we have the services yeah. in place for them. Absolutely. And Maeve, when women do come into you and you know that they're going to, or they've, they've, they're saying, look, I do have a glass of wine and I have had a glass of wine or I have had a gin and tonic or I have had whatever. What do you kind of say to them? What advice and tips would you give them to have an alcohol-free pregnancy? What would mm. you be saying to them? Well, I suppose the first thing is when somebody makes a disclosure of alcohol intake, it is important to we, there's certain questions that we ask to identify, is this just a previous issue because they didn't know they were pregnant or is this an ongoing issue that needs specific addiction support as such? So if it's just that they had some alcohol before they knew they were pregnant and they're very happy to discontinue alcohol use now for the remainder of their pregnancy. It's just about supporting them to if there were particular environments that they used yeah. to go to or particular people that they used to hang out with who maybe wouldn't be as supportive of them having an alcohol free pregnancy to, you know, support them to find other outlets. And equally, you know, as I say, lots of non-alcoholic alternatives, pregnancy is a relatively short time in the uh, duration of somebody's life. And most people can absolutely manage to avoid alcohol. And in fact, many people will say that alcohol in pregnancy isn't the same because of heartburn. And, yes. you know, because of the fact that, yeah, fine, even if they have decided that they want to have one glass at a particular special occasion, that actually it doesn't give them the same feeling that it would outside of pregnancy. Yeah. So for most people, it's not difficult for them to avoid. Yeah. But for some, it is. And as I say, that's where the ongoing support is. So, you know, that they would meet with the drug and alcohol liaison midwife who would do a full assessment yeah. in terms of what supports they might need. Community supports, hospital-based supports, addiction supports. And then keep linking with them, be a consistent, supportive person who they can contact or if they have a slip that they can contact us and let us know they've had a slip. Let us know, look, I thought it was going fine, but actually it's not going as fine as I thought it was and linking them back in. And, you know, I suppose it's interesting and maybe this comes down to our our society as well in that we have very good inpatient detox supports for people in certain areas of the country, say, for example, with opiate addiction. But we don't have the same for alcohol addiction in mm. pregnancy. And it actually can be hard for people to get bespoke addiction support during pregnancy because some of the centres 
don't accept pregnant women. And, you know, some of the guidelines are different in pregnancy and outside of pregnancy and all of that. And as I say, that's why the drug and alcohol liaison midwife is crucial because they can be the sort of pivot point, the the communicator between addiction services and maternity services and really try and optimize the support for people. And, you know, and I suppose it's also important that people don't, you know, if, if they do have a couple of addictions, for example, alcohol and tablets, that they don't sort of say, OK, well, fine, you know, I'll move from alcohol and I'll move on to heroin and tablets instead if alcohol yeah. is so bad, you know. Yeah. So it's important that they are supported with managing their addiction rather than replacing one addiction. Yeah. And I suppose I would hope that they would be extreme, you know, they're extreme cases that we're talking about there. But yeah, they are you know. extreme. But that being said, they happen. Yeah. And yeah. It's important that, you know, just like many complications in pregnancy are relatively rare and, you know, but but the women with addiction in pregnancy are just deserving of care as the woman with another unusual complication of pregnancy or exceptional complication of pregnancy. You know, and again, this comes back to maybe our biases towards sure you should just be able to stop drinking and get on with it for the sake of your baby and the sake of you. And, you know, alcohol is a drug and addiction is an illness. And it's important that we're not judgmental in our response to that and that we're supportive and we take away the fear and the blame and the shame. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because just in preparation of this podcast, you've said that quite a few times about the fear, the blame and the shame. If we could get rid of that for obviously the very severe cases, but also the cases that we see every day of people who do have the few drinks in the evening that they're not scared to tell people and that they do admit it and they just and they don't feel bad about it and they don't feel terrible throughout their whole pregnancy mm-hmm. you know so i think that that is so important that they'd be able to open up and frequently it. you know i meet people with addiction who do feel bad yeah, they do feel shame throughout their pregnancy they don't want to be addicted this yeah. isn't an act of choice to be yeah. addicted and you know they are meeting shame from very many areas of yeah, society yeah. and it's just important that they don't get that in the maternity services that they get yeah. support and you know as I say I suppose that's maybe one of the misunderstood things is people sort of think oh these are women who don't care about their pregnancy yeah. they do and they very much want a healthy baby and a healthy pregnancy but sometimes circumstances are conspiring against them yeah Mary I was going to ask you about the position paper that was sent into the board last year Yes, so the HSE has um, a National Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Expert Advisory Group, and Ava, be honest, and I'm not myself. Yeah. Well, and, I'm uh, very we happy that you are, because you obviously are the, I'm glad I have the experts here with me today. But, <laughs> so we drew up a position paper on pregnancy and alcohol, and um, it includes 14 different goals that uh, we hope to try to reduce, you know, the prevalence of alcohol during pregnancy. Mm-hmm. So it was submitted to the executive management team of the HSE, and was also submitted to the Patient Safety Committee of the Board of the HSE, and both of them have endorsed it. Brilliant. And it also has been endorsed by the Faculty of Public Health Medicine in the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland, by the Institute of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in the Royal yeah. College of Physicians. So we are trying to work on those goals, and they include things like the drug and alcohol liaison midwives and making every contact count and trying to make sure that we have consistent messaging yeah. and, and a lot of other different steps as well. We're also looking at government, you know, to take action really to fully implement the Public Health Alcohol Act and um, to act to try to reduce, you know, the prevalence of alcohol in the population or alcohol per capita, which comes yes. back again to alcohol price, advertising and availability, they need to be reduced. So just to say as well for women who are pregnant who may yeah. have had a drink, you know, there's a benefit from stopping drinking during pregnancy at any stage because yes. the brain, as you said, it continues to re- develop throughout the whole of pregnancy. So, you know, managing to stop at any stage is beneficial. Yeah. Just because you've had a few, like you said earlier on, Maeve, doesn't mean that, oh, well, I've had a few drinks now. Sure, it doesn't matter. I'll just continue. So to, to stop at any stage, I think that's a really good message as well. And it sounds like there is a lot of work 
going on behind the scenes, Mary. And I think that it's just with all of these things, it's just going to take time to get the message through. But people are working on it in the background. And those liaison midwives would be an amazing resource to have in every maternity hospital in the country. I mean, that would be an amazing resource to have. And people then maybe feel because you said, Mary, 50 percent of the people in your research didn't feel comfortable asking. But if they had somebody to refer to, then they, it may make them feel that they could ask the question because then they could help. Like and it said. also embeds education. Yes. You know, if a unit has a drug and alcohol liaison midwife who's not only looking after patients, yeah. but also providing in-service staff education, you know, part of the induction of new staff in the outpatients, yeah. having, you know, for example, about 50% of births in Ireland now are in units that use an electronic patient record. And within that electronic patient record, are the particular questions to ask and the particular language to use. Yes. To ask people about alcohol use either prior to knowing they were pregnant or during pregnancy and whether that alcohol use has discontinued or is an ongoing issue. So there's a couple of factors that will work together to optimise access to support, but also improve education and then improve consistency of messaging and, you know, identifying that this may be an issue in pregnancy can bring with it solutions. Whereas yeah, if yeah. we push it under the carpet and sort Absolutely. of say, no, 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 sure, everybody knows they shouldn't drink in pregnancy yeah. and you never ask, then that's not going to be a supportive place for yeah. a woman to disclose if she has an issue. Absolutely. I mean, it just, yeah, so fingers crossed those people will be put in place soon because it sounds like they'll be an amazing resource. Could so I just come in on yes. uh, one thing as well? You know, you're talking about the shame and the blame. You know, it's not the woman who harms the baby. It's it's the alcohol, you know, and women are not kind of the big alcohol drinkers. Do you know, mm-hmm. the World Health Organization would say just looking at it would say that, you know, men drink approximately four times what women drink. Right. But in the last 20 years, there hasn't been any reduction in alcohol use during pregnancy. And if anything, you know, women are are drinking more. And that's just part of the whole societal culture that we have. So, you know, if we want impact on it, we really do have to look at it as a population approach and with societal support to a safe pregnancy and healthy pregnancy for the mother and for the baby that's developing within the womb. I think that's so important. I think that, like you said, Mary, and you've said it a few times, it's not the woman that's the problem. That's a really, really important yeah. message because of the guilt and the shame. Yeah. So that's a really and important message. And if you think message. back even to a thalidomide, you know, we didn't yeah. blame the woman when the baby was born yeah. with difficulties. We blamed the thalidomide. And we need to look at it the, exactly the same way. Yes. We don't blame the woman for the baby who was born with fetal alcohol spectrum yeah. disorder. We blame the alcohol, you know, and yeah. we need to tackle the alcohol. Absolutely. I think that's a really important message to get across. So, Mary, is there any evidence of what might be effective in reducing FASD in other countries around the world? Well, there is evidence, I suppose. We know in reducing alcohol intake, because alcohol is what we're concerned about, that screening and brief intervention with adults is effective in reducing the amount of alcohol that they take in, which is why it's so important just to raise the issue of alcohol during pregnancy with the woman who's pregnant because it enables an intervention with that woman okay which you know will be a benefit then if she can manage to cut down or or to avoid pregnancy for uh, alcohol for the remainder of her pregnancy the other thing then is a more of a long-term approach for women who actually have a a problematic relationship with alcohol and certainly in north america they've developed these parent child assistance programs they'd be a little bit like the community mothers program that ran at one stage in dublin where they would recruit women who've been in an alcohol exposed uh, kind of within the previous six months or actually are in one. And they kind of provide a wraparound service for that woman for three years for the woman and the baby. And there are very impressive long term results showing that those women who are kind of helped with goal setting and stuff for themselves, they might go back into education. They tend to get more into occupation and stuff like that. So they are too like there is a lot of developments regionally about early childhood intervention and there's probably potential for us to even looking we say working with TUSLA in the inf- interventions that they are doing where they are dealing with child care and protection services that maybe we can modify them as probably not additional resources but just a more targeted use or Very just good. slightly different use of our resources that we kind of look at that sort of a model as well for helping those women who, who are maybe addicted to alcohol and will need additional help to 
try to make sure that their next pregnancy won't be alcohol exposed. That sounds like a really good idea, actually. In these parent-child assistance programmes, what they try to do is they try to get the woman to take, you know, if they can't give up alcohol at the time, that they take effective contraception until they can manage to give up alcohol. They try to get them engaged with alcohol and addiction services. And then they also give them a support. They kind of meet them on a three-monthly basis over a three-year period to help them affect that change in their lives. So they give them that support while they're getting ready for their pregnancy. pregnancy. That's amazing. That is really, really good. It's a fantastic service. And where is that service, Mary? Well, there's a lot of these services. They have been developed in current of the States and in Canada and North America. Yeah. Even in the, the Cool Mind Centre now, they have a kind of a wraparound service in Dublin, which is a parents under pressure scheme that they have brought in from Australia. And that seems to be very beneficial as well. So we are trying to move towards that type of supportive service yeah. for those women who will, who will have difficulty in giving up alcohol. So there pregnancy. does seem to be, even though on the outset you think, oh, we don't have a lot of stuff, but there seems to be an awful lot of stuff that people are trying to do where there's the start of different projects and that we just have to keep them consistent, consistent. and we just have to make sure that they're carried through and that the strategy is introduced and the board paper and everything. I mean, so there is a lot of, a lot of work underway. Yeah. So for people who are listening today, we want to give them a little bit of advice. Of, they haven't maybe said it to their midwife or they haven't said it to their GP. Where would they go to find help on this if they just wanted to find help themselves? Because they do have that shame and guilt. And where would we send them to, Mary? Well, of course, we I suppose we have information up on the HC website yeah. and the askaboutalcohol.ie webpage and also on the mychild.ie webpage. But the, we have a helpline. We have a drug and alcohol Very helpline. Good. And I might give out the number of that, if that would be OK. Absolutely. 1-800-459-459. And yeah. that's available during normal working hours. So okay. it's confidential and the people who will yeah. be listening to you, they're skilled in, yes. in helping you so and in directing you to where you can get local support. So this isn't only for women who are pregnant. This no, is this a drug is for, and alcohol helpline for everybody. Anybody, yeah. If somebody was pregnant and they wanted to get that confidential support, then they could go to that number. What was that number again, Mary? It is 1-800-459-459. And they'd be aware of all the local supports that, Very good. that a woman yeah. or anybody can get if they want to address yeah. we'll say their alcohol if they're not happy themselves with their consumption of alcohol and they want to make a change very good and Maeve what would your if you had three things that you would like to see implemented in the near future what would be the main things that you think would help well for sure the embedding of consistent education yeah. and consistent messaging yes having supports in maternity units yeah for people to access both in terms of information if they're worried about their alcohol intake prior to coming to the maternity unit, but certainly in terms of ongoing supports, if they feel alcohol is not something that they can discontinue use of now that they yeah. know it's it's unsafe in pregnancy. And thirdly, you know, I think as, as Mary says, from a societal perspective, it is important that we just look at some of our, even look at some of our own behaviours, you know, mm. you see somebody not drinking and as you said yourself, oh, What's up with you? Why aren't you drinking? Yeah. You know, why is it that people can't socialize without alcohol or that it's seen as the exception rather than the rule? And, you know, I think all of that stuff that you've mentioned in other podcasts, in including uh, Dr. Sheila Gilhini's one, you know, the stuff about advertising. And, you know, we do have an issue in this country and in many other countries. We're not yeah. alone, but it's important that we see it potentially as a problem rather than just, oh, sure, it's only alcohol. I'd really like to thank Maeve and Mary for being with us today. And for the listeners, I'd like to point them in the direction of the helpline number that Mary mentioned earlier on. And it was 1-800-459-459. If you'd like to find more information on how to have an alcohol-free pregnancy, please go to hse.ie or mychild.ie and you'll find supports and tips on how to have an alcohol-free pregnancy. Thanks so much for listening.